So welcome everybody. Please come in. Please have take a seat, if you will. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna get started. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Sophia Greskin. I direct the Institute on Inequalities in Global Health at the University of Southern California, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's plenary conversation: the future of global health. What will it take? And I, I want to thank, first of all, CUGH for supporting this plenary session, and special thanks to Keith Martin for collaboration and support for the plenary, but also for the conference as a whole. Um, it's been quite a day so far, uh, but this evening we're going to have a conversation about the current state of global health, including the current status of both structures and approaches to global health, and I mean that for good or for bad, uh, the hope, ideally, is that this conversation can help move us all forward in envisioning what could be the future of global health, our values, our institutions, and our ways of working, and the concrete actions that might be needed to realize those visions. Um, this is an important conversation to have at this moment for obvious reasons, and for many of the issues that have come up actually throughout the day and the sessions that we've all been in. Um, I could not be more excited for this panel and for these wonderful people who have agreed to help us think this through. Um, if I can say what I find super exciting, okay, and I'm just going to do this, is that, if you, is that our panelists represent diverse perspectives, institutions, backgrounds, disciplines, geographies, and are at very different stages of their careers. So what they share is a concern for health, for equity, and for making a positive difference in the world today. And I expect in this conversation that there may be some moments of divergence in ways of thinking, and I think we would all welcome this because I think we all think that how we're going to get together to be able to build a better and stronger vision for the future of global health is really to have those conversations. Um, it's an honor, really, to have this wonderful panel of people here with us. And I hope that this conversation can inspire all of us to think about our own visions for the future of global health and what's needed going forward to ensure that our work, the structures of global health, and the field more generally aligns with the visions that we hold. So hopefully the conversation tonight can help stimulate some rich discussions to carry us forward in the days ahead, or at least at the cocktail party right afterwards. So with that, um, let me introduce our wonderful panelists. So over here we have Dr. Patty Garcia, who is a professor and former dean of the School of Public Health at Cayetano Heredia University, Lima, Peru. She's a member of the US National Academy of Medicine. She is the former Minister of Health of Peru and former chief of the Peruvian National Institute of Health. She is also an affiliate professor of both the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington and of the School of Public Health at Tulane University. She is a well-recognized leader in global health and is very well known to this audience, I think, in particular. Uh, she's been a member of many Lancet commissions, including, I'm just going to do some of them, right, including for the Education of Health Professionals for the 21st Century, the Commission on Diagnostics, the Commission on Medical Oxygen of Implementation Research. She's chairing the Commission on Cancer and Health Systems. And she's also actively involved in research and training and implementation and health systems research, with her work increasingly moving more into research into policy in Peru and in Latin America. And she serves on many global advisory boards. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Garcia. Uh, yes, please, let, let, let's welcome each of our panelists. Absolutely. Uh, next, we have Dr. Jocelyn Clark. She is an award-winning public health scientist and journalist, and she is one of the world's most experienced medical journal editors. She has spent more than 20 years as an editor at the BMJ, at the Lancet, and at PLOS Medicine. She was recently appointed international editor for the BMJ in August 2022, rejoining the journal 20 years after having started her editorial career there. And she came directly after having served as executive editor at the, editor at the Lancet between 2016 and 2022. And her editorial leadership has been central to globalizing and diversifying the top medical journals. Now, if that wasn't enough, Right? She is an advisor to Global Health 5050 and Women Lift Health. 
She's a co-founder of Canadian Women in Global Health and Women in Global Health Canada. She's an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and honorary associate professor at the Institute for Global Health at the University College London. And in 2019, she was elected into fellowship at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, both in recognition of her scholarship and leadership in advancing gender equity, the social and political context of health, and medical publishing. Welcome, Dr. Clark. <laughs> Clapping is good. It works, right? It's like, yeah, OK. All right. Uh, next, if, if I may, we have Faith Nawagi, uh, who many of us met this morning. Right, um, in her role, her excellent role as moderator uh, for the discussion with Dr. Goosby. She is the African representative for the Foundation for Advancement of International Med Medical Education and Research, a member of Intel, an integrated organization that also includes the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, where she leads the implementation and evaluation of the organization's Africa programs. She's based in Kampala, Uganda. She recently completed her PhD, a reason to clap, Right? in health professional education at Makerere University. She received her master's in international public health in global health from Euclid University, a postgraduate certificate in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics from the University of California, San Francisco, and she holds a bachelor's degree in nursing and midwifery from Makerere as well. Uh, she's led various multi-country projects and programs in Africa, all in the domain of global health, the health workforce and the internationalization of health professionals education in 20 countries and with 56 training institutions. And she has several global health and health equity academic roles with the University of Minnesota, with Nexus International University, with Sigma Academy, the University of Oxford and Cambridge University, as well as various scientific publications in the global health field. Welcome, Dr. Nawagi. And last and certainly not least, we have Professor Danielle Tarantola, who is a physician and global health leader. He completed his medical education and training in Paris, and among the many areas where he has been actively engaged, those that have particularly marked his career are participation in the global eradication of smallpox, the strategic formulation, launching, and senior leadership roles he played in WHO in rolling out first the global program on AIDS, the childhood, the expansion of childhood immunization in Asia, the Pacific, and across the African continent, as well as his contributions to humanitarian health emergencies, just to name one place in Kosovo, but to name of the many places where he's done this work. And among the many awards that he has won, he was recognized for his contributions to the elimination of wild polio in Africa in 2020. Now, outside of his work with multilaterals, he was part of the founding and the work of the François Xavier Benyou Center for Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health. He was the founder and professorial chair of a cross-faculty initiative on health and human rights at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And he's currently adjunct professor of research at the University of Southern California's Keck School of Medicine's Department of Population and Public Health Sciences and a fellow with the USC Institute on Inequalities and Global Health. Welcome, Danielle Tarantola. Uh, so you can see, what a panel, right? This is, this is going to be fun, all right? Uh, you really are an amazing group. So I'm going to start with my first question. So the way that I want to do this is I'm going to ask a few questions, and I'm going to ask us to kind of go down the row, right? And then I'll have some questions maybe more targeted to individuals that, that we can go with from there. So can I start, and just to say, to orient us, besides these amazing bios that, that you have, um, can you briefly describe the perspective you bring to your work and what is called global health? Help us understand the vantage point you're going to bring to this conversation. Caddy, can I start with you? Um, OK. I have been working in, in this area of collaboration and for almost 30 years, and probably m several of you have already seen me saying this exact thing here minutes <laughs> ago, but in that seat, right? <laughs> um, and, and actually, I eventually, through the years, I understood that this way of working collectively and collaboratively 
is global health, mm -hmm. okay? Um, however, I always struggled with the fact that uh, several times when people think about global health is to work with some, is working with somebody who is in the south. Mm -hmm. And actually Peru is in the south and I not necessarily work with people that are southern of me. <laughs> what I try to work, is, I mean, I work in issues that um, are critical for my country, but also are critical for other countries and for populations, and that could bring new answers that could be used without boundaries. Mm -hmm. And for me also, and, and this is quite important, is that um, working in global health, I realized that this is not global health, um, has nothing, nothing to do with just physicians or nurses. I mean, it's a matter of working collaboratively. So that's why if, if you see what I have been working on, I have been working on I mean, I'm an, I'm an infectious diseases person. I started working with HIV and STIs, but then working with STIs, I started working with syphilis, and then starting seeing issues with um, maternal problems, congenital syphilis, and then pregnant women, and then from pregnant women going into cervical cancer, which at the end is also an infectious disease. But all those issues, for me, had to do with global health, because in a way we can share also solutions. Great, thank you, thank you, that, that helps a lot. Jocelyn, how about you? Thank you. Do I need to turn this on or you can hear me? I think you're good. Uh, thank you, I mean, thank you for including me, a wonderful, um, a wonderful company I'm in. As Sophia said, I'm Jocelyn Clark, I'm a professional journal editor. I am Canadian and I trained in the public health sciences and in women's studies. But I've spent all of my career as a professional journal editor. And over that period of time, the last 20 years, I've become increasingly interested in and devoted to helping improve coverage of global health in the big general medical journals. That is principally around topic areas, you know, burning issues, strategic priorities, some of the neglected issues that are occurring around the world um, that would otherwise not be visible. But really, very importantly, a lot of the work that I try to do um, with my team and, and, and many other journal editors that are interested in, in progressive change is to ensure that the contributors, the authors of uh, research and commentary in global health are those with in-country expertise rejecting that old traditional model, which really isn't that old, where folks from high-income countries would be speaking on behalf of our colleagues and issues in the so-called Global South. That is not an inconsiderable challenge for medical journals, which of course are bastions of old, often colonial and extractive, um, often male, um, and certainly high income um, based structures. And what I've um, really appreciated, particularly over the last, let's say, five to seven years, um, as there's been more visibility given to the power asymmetries within this enterprise we call global health, the ways in which um, we're not delivering on our goals to um, redress inequities and in health and beyond. What I've really appreciated is this constant journey of learning um, that I have experienced and we, I believe, as journals have experienced from our colleagues in the Global South, from those who are creating thought leadership that are really challenging our traditional practices and processes. And so my vantage point, if you know, I'm very honest with you, is that the future of global health, of course, is not with people like me sitting on this stage to tell you what the priorities and the future ambition ought to be. The future is, is Africa, is India, is the young people um, in this room. Um, but nevertheless, I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the debate, and I look forward to our conversation. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Faith, please. All right, thank you so much. I won't go through my details again. Uh, Sophia did it so well. Um, I bring 
an experience of 10 years building global health programs in Africa. My vantage point here is in advancing global experiential learning, health professions, education capacity development, but most importantly, exhibiting that there is something good in Africa if we do it regionally and through regional global collaboration, but also with a vantage point of including multilateralism as we do these things or whatever it is regionally, how do we also partner with other regions so that we strike an equilibrium like what Dr. Eric Gusby was saying today morning. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Danielle, please. Thank you. Um, when I was a, a baby dinosaur some years ago, <laughs> I got involved in uh, international health, we would call it at the time, and cooperation through NGOs, and one of which was actually the precursor of uh, MSF, that is Doctors Without Borders. And so then um, we moved on, I moved on to working for international organizations, WHO in particular. When global health was really emerging and growing very, very fast, in the early 2000s actually, uh, thanks to um, Fond, generous funding from various agencies and so forth, and some agreements at the World Health Assembly that this would be a better concept than others. And I think the key concept under global health is that it is a unifying uh, goal and a unifying process. It brings together disciplines within the health disciplines. It brings together, importantly, public health, and medical care together, as we saw particularly during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. It brings together state, non-state actors, and uh, people from the global south and people from the global north. And that, that, I think, is a very valid concept, both in terms of processes that are triggered to facilitate this uh, newly um, stimulated uh, unity public health. So what's interesting is, is many of you have sort of touched already on kind of a, your own definition of global health in explaining the vantage point that you bring. So I, I'd like to kind of go a little bit deeper with that and just ask you, the, the perspective that you bring, how much do you think the world is currently, or maybe if I can say you're hearing my vantage point now, ever did live up to that standard, to that ethos, to, the, to that approach? You know, when you think about the lessons that we've learned as a global community, particularly from all that we've lived through over the last several years with COVID. You know, what does that mean to you in terms of thinking about the definition of global health and its evolution? What should that definition look like? Not where we are, but where should we be going with that definition? Um, do you mind going first? Sorry, I, is that okay? I mean, well, we could go down the road. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, that's okay. Okay. I, I, let's do it the other way around. How's that? Just to play with it. Just to play with All it. All right. Danielle, so what, what should global health uh, mean in practice? Um, I think it means um, bringing, again, uh, actors together and our goals that are quantifiable, measurable, accountable for. I think um, it brings together the, particularly the private sector and uh, some partnerships that have worked quite well, it seems, during the COVID pandemic in the field of uh, scientific advancement. And I think what remains to be done is to shift the control of, this me of these mechanisms and these resources to the global south from the global north. And um, I'm not a politician, but I think that um, global politics now have been able to put global health on their political agenda as a result, probably, and largely, uh, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But today, certainly, more than ever, uh, global health is on political agendas. It, it is our role now as public health practitioners to make it stay there. 
and be implemented in reality. Thanks, Faith, please. All right. Um, I want to think of global health today and what we've learned through COVID as an aspect that points us to interprofessional collaborative practice. And I've also thought through this, and I think it's not only about us health workers working together. I want to make a little quiz today. Um, how many of us are from training institutions? You can just put up your hand. All right, and how many of us are from the care side? You are at the front line, you're practicing as a nurse, me midwife, or doctor. All right, how many of us are from the regulatory part of the profession? I mean, you are part of the councils and all that in the room, anyone? All right. How many of us are from the ministries of health in that domain? In fact, many times the care providers are in the health side. And then education side, we are, you know. So what am I trying to say? I wish our future global health would enable us develop health workforce modeling. Why? We, the teachers, the training institutions, sit and plan alone, you know. The role of the regulator is to ensure that whoever is ready to work, they are given the license to practice and who consumes the private and uh, public sector for care and all that. So you know why we have these issues? Because we never sit and plan together. So we may underproduce or overproduce or lack the ability to deal with the new courses we are you know, bringing up without really sitting with the employer, if this is something relevant, you know, will the employer take it? I want to look at it as a market concept. I'm not saying that health is business, no. But let's learn from our telecom people. Before they launch a new product, before they produce a product, they come to the market to the consumer and understand what is it that they need, how much is it, and they produce to ensure that we are all okay. So I think in global health, looking at that perspective, I wish we would have multi-sectoral collaboration so that we jointly plan alongside the priorities of the social determinants of health, who will address them, the health workforce, who produces these health workers, the teachers, who mandates them to be eligible, the regulators, and the consumer, the employers. So as a result, we'll also be able to harness things like AI. I know AI is here too, you know? <laughs> it's a threat to all of us, and many times we think, would it take away our jobs? You know, now people can learn from anything, you know, compared to before. They would come to class and learn, but today someone can sit in their room and learn. But how do we harness this technology to be more known to over, we don't see it as a competitor, but a complementary to how we move both in education, in regulation, and in care. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, Jocelyn. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Okay, so what is my definition of global health? I, I've really, you gave us these questions in advance and we're all meant to reflect on them and I think this is one of those that's like seductively simple but actually <laughs> kind of a trick question and I'll tell you yeah. why. I think that in some respects what we're seeing here both on the panel and, and in the gathering of all of these wonderful people who have come together that there's such a range of activity under the umbrella of global health that it is, you know, a, on one level, a very broad church. But on another level, I think there's a great deal of anxiety with this enterprise we call global health. In fact, in such a way that we're probably having, as a community of people who care about global health kind of having a bit of a identity crisis. And I think that's probably why you've brought this panel together um, to a certain degree. And I think that's because the term and perhaps the definition of global health has slipped into something 
that's become a bit of a buzzword and a bit eroded of its original meaning. And I think that that's feeling very problematical to a lot of people. And of course, at the same time, are these really incredibly important movements that are, as I said in my opening remarks, are beginning to question who holds the power um, in global health, who gets to define what the priorities are, who gets to publish in the top journals, who gets to you know, be on the platform in order to discuss it. So, but for me, what I think about in global health is to try to simplify it, and in my own work, I think of it as um, an outcome that a fairly treated, healthy human population and planet is global health. But equally, in the place where I'm at in my, I guess, journey, I think of it also as a mindset and that we achieve global health only by accepting that there is a collective responsibility for the world's health, that it is not the responsibility of individual nations, for example, or, or communities. And that we also need to assume responsibility um, collectively for delivering on equity, which is at the core of achieving a fairly treated, healthy human population and planet. And recognize that resources are not evenly distributed. And when I reflect on my sort of within the world of global health, the, the atmosphere in which I work, which is in a medical journal, that, there, that very crucially is part of a system of the global production of knowledge that exists equally with academic institutions and funders. Together, we comprise that global production of knowledge, and it's only together that we can achieve um, the goals of, of global health. We're not able to do that um, as individuals. To your question about what COVID has taught us and perhaps is making us all um, reflect on what global health means and our own role in it, I think two things. COVID, you know, undoubtedly has taught us that um, the world is interdependent, but the world is more unequal than it ever has been. And that any activity, human activity, including scientific activity, will deliver inequalities unless we explicitly design it from the beginning not to do so. And the second, of course, um, during COVID, I believe, was a lesson that only social justice and rights protection will dis deliver health and well-being. Well, it's so interesting to hear that you, uh, you see global health as an outcome, right? And, uh, but I have always seen global health more as a movement and as a process, um, kind of like a collective effort to address the most pressing challenges that cannot be addressed unless we do it all together. So that has been for me always the concept of global health. So we are all in global health, so we are all in this collective movement. Um, and I have been living in dark cloud, you know, uh, with lots of collaborators and doing all kinds of things until COVID came. And um, coming from South America, the region that suffered the most because of COVID, and coming from Peru, the country with the highest rate of deaths per million, I realized that there is no solidarity in the world, there is no social justice, and there is no global health. And that is why I think that we are discussing these issues, because that needs to change. Because global health, for me, this process, this collective action, was kind of like a, like a safety network for everybody like a way of assuring health security, 
But it seems that I was one of the very few people that was thinking about that. And the rest of the world, most of the world, showed during COVID that that's not how they see it. And now, all this movement of decolonization, and I'm sorry, but this is, I mean, I'm telling you this from the bottom of my heart, okay? I feel that it seems to me like global health has been seen more like financial assistance, and the colonization of global health is we don't want to give any more financial assistance. So, it is, for me, it has been kind of like a crisis I still think that we, because I'm an optimistic, definitely, okay, I still feel that there are people that think like me, but I think we need to really see how can we position global health at that, as that safety network for everybody. So it's, it's a little um, selfish, but it's okay, because we want to protect the whole world for everybody, for me, for for all of us, I mean, we want to protect health, no boundaries, etc. But somehow, we haven't been able to really transfer that message. Can I, can I go a little further with you, if I, if I may? Can we, can we just go, go a little bit deeper on this? I mean, I, I think, you know, we are all seeing and experiencing these challenges, right, in terms of what does it mean at this point to action health within our, our countries and, and, and globally. And, and it also seems right now that we all are seeing that the structures, the approaches, what we had in place that were designed decades ago have fallen short. I mean, I think that there's, there's no question. You said you're an optimist, right? So are you, are you worried? Do you feel this is a new low? Do you think that this is a pendulum swing? Ms. Optimist, right? So that it's a pendulum swing and that we're gonna be able to bring things back into balance? Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Well, I, I, I think there is hope. I always think that there is hope, okay? And I think that we are at this point in which um, we need to discuss, I mean, what do we want from global health, okay? And um, it's not assistance, okay? We need to think about equity, but equity means empowering, empowering everybody, empowering countries. Um, there, I mean, I really thought that, for example, the pandemic treaty, as when it started, I saw that as a, a great, that could become a great example of getting together and putting, like, the lines of how should we act and how can we do better for the future, for example, in the case of COVID. But I have seen that, for example, in that treaty, equity. I mean, it started, that word was like 20, 40 times in one of the drafts, and now there is like only nine times equity, right? So um, I think the fact that we are all here, that there are like about 1,500 people in the, at this meeting discussing the issue of global health gives me hope. But I think we need to have a real movement because, and, and, and movement, and I say this early in the morning, a movement that is not just because we are good people and because we are doing some type of um, service to the rest of the world or to the ones that are at the bottom of the planet, right? But because we all as humanity need to work together mm. and collectively, otherwise there is not going to be a world. So I think we are at that tipping point in which we have to do something, and I hope it's good, and we have to discuss how should we see this collective action, how can we set up the rules, how can we not only um, assist countries, but, but empower countries because our governments and our countries in low middle income countries have responsibilities and how can we also push from the bottom up and from the sides to make a difference mm -hmm. I totally i totally hear you I, I mean you know danielle i'm going to turn to you uh, on this because you know we are clearly in a very challenging moment i think is what, what we could say 
And you know, I think we're all struggling like with what Patty was saying. What are the structures, what are the approaches in global health that are gonna move, move us forward? So I guess you have such a long experience with the United Nations and with WHO. You know, what do you see in terms of their role as you think about the, the future of global health? What about multilateralism? Does it still make sense? Like, what do you think about that in terms of as we move forward? But also, you know, we've been talking about governments. What hasn't come up in this conversation yet is civil society. But also kind of thinking about civil society. You know, what are your concerns? What are some of the ideas that you have about what would be useful? Not a tiny question. Not a tiny question, but certainly a constantly raised um, complex issue. That is, how could the leadership on health, which, which constitutes the biggest aspiration of all peoples around the world, if you make surveys here and there and whatnot, health and security, and health is part of security. So the biggest aspiration in the world would require a very strong leadership. The United Nations created the World Health Organization. It doesn't fit that pattern. WHO has no power of enforcement of what the World Health Assembly, its governing body, decides. And it's good that way. It's better that way, in my view. Uh, colleagues may disagree here, but it's better to use the WHO as a forum for every country to be able to express itself and its problems. And um, any country from a population of 100,000 to a population of uh, 300, or one, 300 million or 1 billion now can speak openly in a World Health Assembly. Now, there are, of course, corridors, discussions, and, and debates which are complex and not always transparent. But the organization overall fulfills, I think, the best it can today, the role of um, global umbrella for health and leadership for health as well. Um, I think one of the strengths of WHO has been further strengthened, which was in the regulatory field. But um, it has recently created this humanitarian health, human, humanitarian health emergency department. It's more than a department. It's a whole pillar of WHO now. And these are people who are looking at uh, emerging public health challenges, in particular epidemics, pandemics, and other threats to public health and security nationally and globally. And so it has now this possible way to, inter to interact directly with countries and support them. Um, one of the barriers to this was that the major contributors to the WHO regular budget um, uh, were against the idea of augmenting the budget of the WHO in the light of uh, the COVID pandemic et cetera, at the beginning. But the World Assembly decided otherwise, that the budget should be augmented and its allocation to uh, low and medium income countries should be improved, increased. So I think there, has been, there have been questions about governance. Some people would dream of a governance that would bring together the public and the private sector, um, NGOs, indeed, civil society, so there are forums for this, the World Health Assembly being one of them, but when it comes to the executive power that controls WHO, um, there have been sort of problematic issues bringing the private industry, the private sector, health sector, into the decision-making process of WHO. So the, it's, it's a process that's evolving. It's a structure that's evolving. There are consultations very often between the WHO, naturally governments, uh, private industry representatives, and NGO, civil society. And these are things sufficient to enrich the dialogue at this time. Um, the role of governments, of course, hasn't changed much, uh, moving from the concept of n international health, international health, to global health. I think the government still remain at the center of their decision making, the builders of their autonomy. Um, 
I think it can be felt very often that governments are not necessarily the best interlocutors and collaborators with civil society, um, and that should be worked on and expanded. But government in the concept of global health are in no way disempowered of uh, their control of the health of their population. So that's the way I see it today. Thanks. I, I wonder if anybody else on the panel has any thoughts about this. Anything anybody wants to add to this? Oh, we're good. Okay. I will, I will, I will move us on then. Okay. Um, so, you know, Jocelyn, I, I think one of the things that, that's been really clear about this moment is that I think we are all seeing this as a moment where we see regression happening in a major way. We see unequal power dynamics in, in all of the different things actually that we've been talking about. In, in, this, in the future, and, and I mean this for real now, in, in, in a kind of an operational way, not in a rhetorical way, which is, I want to be really clear about that. Do you still, and I, I almost hate to ask this question, but do you still see a place for human rights? Do you still see a place for attention to equity, to accountability in terms of how the work moves forward? There have been so many shifts lately. I, I just, where do you think things are moving from here? <laughs> a little question again. Yeah, another little question. I should have known. Um, it's actually kind of a loaded question. Um, I'm going to answer it in a, in a couple of ways. And, and thank you, Sophia. I mean, the question about whether equity and accountability has a place in the current or future global health, I think is, I mean, clearly the answer is yes. But the other reflection is, and, and this is, with all due respect, this is not a, a criticism, but the, but the other reflection is, you know, why the hell are we asking that question about global health? Because my recollection is when this so-called movement, I agree with you uh, greatly, Patty, it's a movement, it's a process, it's a set of activities, it's a collective, etc. But when it was birthed, which was maybe 20 or 25 years ago, recall that we were sort of rejecting those old notions that we used to put under the banner of international health, thinking that global health was a more inclusive, just, um, collaborative, cooperative, like authentically global enterprise. And the very aim and vision of the birth of global health was to drive equity and accountability in health worldwide. So I guess, you know, 20, 25 years hence, we're sitting here today and we're, we still, I mean, it's a very, very legitimate question despite the fact that it depresses the hell out of me. It, that, this, that we still are returning to these same um, questions. It's like the, it's like the old, um, you know, the old tired experience of, you know, the problem always being described, but the solution never being, being actioned. Mm -hmm. It's like we're kind of like little hamsters on a wheel going around and around about how we deliver equity and, and trying to do so with the same structures built up around us. And I think, um, you know, we ignore at our peril the questions being asked of those of us who have the enormous privilege of helping lead global health, we ought not ignore what, what we're being challenged around, which is how our resources and visibility and power and privilege and advantage being distributed, it's consistently shown to be inequitable. So that's the long answer. The short answer is um, yes. Can I have two more minutes to Please. give an example? It depends, but yes, of course. Because um, I can really, on the issue of, I mean, of course I'm not a, a, a human rights um, expert, although I, I know enough about rights to know how fundamental it is to, to health and how fundamental um, and vital rights protections are to you know, creating a level playing field and an equality of opportunity. And so I'd like to just use an example from the world that I do know about, which is journal publishing. And that's because during, um, 
during the pandemic, I mean, I think all of us recognize that there was massive backslides in a whole bunch of areas of equality. Um, my area is gender equality. It was very clear that um, for lots of indicators, um, women had um, backslid. But in the specific um, area of journal publishing, um, there was a real explosion, a real tsunami of research and commentary um, being produced during the pandemic. Of course, you know, we we're trying to inform a public health response. Everyone was trying to help. Loads of people kind of pivoted from their um, areas of expertise in order to become a COVID expert. And there were, like in history, the largest number of articles put into the scientific literature as there ever had been. But these opportunities to publish, which is very tied to um, academic advancement, were not equal. And during the pandemic, the output of men vastly, vastly outpaced that of women. And publication, of course, being such a key currency, um, you know, favored men, particularly as citations to journal articles were enormous for COVID-related content. That then, of course, generates visibility. There's lots of documentation to show that on scientific task forces, in the media, in, um, in different advisory committees, that men had opportunities and women were very much underrepresented. This can be explained partly by the fact that during the early parts of the pandemic, during lockdown, I mean, women were disproportionately shouldering the burden of care work and men were available they had the privilege of choice to you know have their covid moment and be on the television news sit at their desk and and write and why this is so important to the question of equity and accountability is that those losses to women's um, academic output and their publication records aren't just short-term losses. Even as women's productivity has now been recovering, those losses have long-term impacts. And it's not just on women's career advancement, but on the knowledge base and on future research questions. And that's because we know from decades of research and before the pandemic that women people of color, diverse research teams, they ask different research questions. They do research differently. And so these losses of these women's researchers, this type of research, the funding that was diverted to COVID has long-term implications for which there are very, very important questions around accountability. Those are accountability on the part of funders, on the part of academic institutions that, um, tie publication so strongly to evaluation of their faculty members and, of course, to journals. So do I see the future as um, being about equity and accountability? Absolutely. And I will say, um, I apologize for, for taking so much time, but what I will say is that Unfortunately, the irony is that journals, I believe, are one of our best functions is to be a tool of accountability, to be that platform to allow for challenging questions, important debates, evidence-based advocacy to take place. I mean, you see this all the time. You mentioned several Lancet commissions, collections of articles that we do at big journals, the ways that we can use the journal pages as a platform to amplify some of the important, tough questions around equity and accountability um, that are being raised. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's no better uh, tool in order to do that. Um, and I hope we continue to do that. Um, incredibly sobering to start with. Um, I, I just, that gets me thinking about pipeline and gets me thinking about education and training. And you know, so many of us at CEGH are involved in education and training in, in, in some way. Faith, can I turn to you in, on, on this? And, and just, you know, when you think about having listened to all this, to everything that we've all lived over these last few years, when you think about the next generation 
of global health practitioners. What's the training you think is imperative for all students who say that they're engaged in global health to do? No, no matter what the field, no, no matter what the discipline, is there anything actually that, that should be standard? But we're looking for a way to bring coherence to the field, and in many ways, education and training is part of that. So I'd love to hear your reflections. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Sophia. So I'm going to refer to a common African proverb. We love to say at AfriHealth and in Africa, if you want to go, is it fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. So the future practitioners of which I am part of them, you know, I think we need to work together. Uh, not just work together, but learn how to work with, learn from, you know, and all that. So that interprofessional collaborative practice is key. But I also think the normal little value of human principles of living I feel when you go to the front line, sometimes the health workers are rude, you know, they are not kind. Let's teach compassion. I don't know how we will teach that, you know, but let's teach compassion. Let's teach empathy. We lose nothing in being good to people, especially when they are coming to you, you know, for help. And what will it take to do this um, in addition to this kind of training? We need to, this is both actually what's another skill that we should have, but also a way to, to you know, move forward. We need to think of sustainable global health innovation and financing. And I think that needs to be added in the curriculum somewhere. You know, much of global health is donor funded and uh, all that. And many times the funders have a timeline. By this time, it's three years and after that, yeah, the grant is done. But man, you've developed this amazing work and it would change the world and you know, and everything. So I think we need to have that training on innovation in sustainable, you know, innovation and financing, but also to the practice side moving forward. How do we genuinely sit on table with the funder and us who implement global health to really, you know, call a sped a sped from the word go. Let's have sustainable plans financing, resources, whatever it is, at the very starting point of any innovation. I also think um, prioritizing, you know, as global health practitioners and all that, the way forward has always been, we should be more, in, more motivated, more, you know, upfront, you know, and all that. But also, we should also remember that whoever we are at the front line in research and education, we are human beings. You know? So at the end of the day, if we are human beings, how do we ensure that the, the health of us, the health workers, is being prioritized? And this is really multi-sectoral, you know, in terms of remuneration and all that. And maybe that speaks to what I was saying. People sometimes have lost those normal human principles of being kind and things like that. But it could speak to a health worker who is facing burnout, and be many times as a frontliner, and if you're labeled a health worker, you're known to be the solution. As a result, that makes you not go for help, you know? Not seek help in whatever it is that you need mentally and all that. So we should create a way forward that allows health workers' well-being to also be prioritized. I also think advancing innovation and technology use is key. I still insist AI is here to stay. So how do we collaborate with it to make, it, to make us better as opposed to resisting it? Because it will grow. And it's in fact um, a solution from previous innovations. AI didn't come out of the future. It came from the past. So how do we utilize AI to move forward in a collaborative way? Yeah. 
Thanks. I, I, I'm, I'm about to open it up for questions from, from the audience, but a, as we move into that piece, I wanted to do, I'm going to call it a lightning round, if, if I may, um, but I, I'd love to hear from each of you, just, you know, having been part of this conversation and reflections that you have just generally, you know, what is like the key priority, the key takeaway you would like people to take away from the conversation that we just had? What's the priority that you see as being the thing we all need to be thinking about, really, if we're look, talking about the future of global health? Um, I don't know where to start. Um, sure, Danielle, on that end. Let's start on that end and come back down this road. Okay, thank you. Um, there have been millions of uh, victims to the um, COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. There has been a huge collateral damage as well on health systems. And if I want to sort of see um, a, a way where resources are necessary and attention and thinking and new uh, configuration of uh, health systems, it is the area of rehabilitating, reconstructing health systems that have been really pushed to the extreme during the pandemic. And within the health systems, I think the human resources for health is probably the, the critical component that has suffered most. We have in many countries, um, in particular in high economies now, a shortage of health staff. Many walked away from health systems after the, being burnt out during the pandemic. Some were threatened, uh, abused verbally or physically during the pandemic by dissatisfied uh, patients and their uh, families or their friends. So uh, if I were to try and bring your attention on one area where major efforts in terms of new thinking, development, and um, system design, it is the health system area uh, that would focus largely, but not exclusively, on uh, human resources for health. I hear you. I hear you. Faith? Sure. Um, I think everyone here today is important, and the reason we are all here today is because we want to contribute, but we also want to learn. So I feel everyone should go back feeling they are the solution, wherever you are and wherever you're coming from. You're the solution. The solution is not all about first partnering with North northern, uh, northern countries or Africa and all that. You're the solution by doing something about the problem within your, your means, like within your locality and all that. With time, build it into your country regionally, then you know internationally if you need, so, need to do so. And uh, most importantly, don't go alone, you know, but if you want to go far, go with people, collaborate. It's, it feels nice to have a team, you know? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, I appreciate that very much. Jocelyn, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, I wrote down what you said, uh, Faith, and I'm gonna just kind of reflect on that. So you said everyone is, is important and we're all part of the solution. Um, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to your question, Sophia, by um, just reflecting on the fact that we've talked a lot about equity. I think we've talked a little bit about power. I think we've talked a bit about what the pandemic has done to kind of turn upside down a lot of our lives, our expectations. And probably we're all here because we wonder what on earth the future of global health ought to look like, but also, I presume, our own role in it. So I'd like to answer your question by, by saying that I've been thinking a lot about my own role as a journal editor, but also my own role as, um, you know, a woman who's, um, you know, born and raised in Canada, works in Britain, and really wishes to be um, a positive uh, force within global health, but also takes very seriously the challenges around us, including the decolonization of global health movement. And I would like to share that what I have found really, really interesting are 
ideas around critical allyship and the kind of learning that we perhaps can all have if instead of looking toward all the structures around us that require change, but to be reflexive about our own role in it. And in particular, I want to highlight the work of somebody called Stephanie Nixon, who's in Toronto, and she conceptualized this idea of the coin model. And it's a way of sort of concretizing those ideas of, you know, taking sort of anti-oppression, anti-racist, um, and feminist ideals and bringing them into your own life. And she, she um, has this coin model, which I'm, I'm going to read out, which asks people to, instead of saying or thinking about your own role in global health as wishing to help the less fortunate or wishing to use my own expertise to reduce inequities for marginalized populations, what she asks us to reflect on is making a commitment as follows. I seek to understand my own role in upholding systems of oppression that create health inequities. I learn from the expertise of and work in solidarity with historically marginalized groups to help me understand and take action on systems of inequalities. And that this includes working to build insight among others in positions of privilege and mobilizing in collective action under the leadership of people in the Global South. I mean, I found that very powerful and very instructive. Um, so I wanted to share that and encourage you to um, explore it if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you for that. Patty, please. Yeah. So if there is something that I would like you to um, get from this discussion is um, number one, it has to do with the fact that the world is turning upside down, okay? And now we have models like Africa with the Africa CDC that are showing us the importance of taking the lead from the from the, the regions, okay? So I think that something that may change in global health is that we need to have more regionalism, okay? For me, that's a great example. And I said turning upside down because I, I think that what they are doing is wonderful. This morning, I heard also that African Union um, is creating this risk insurance for countries in case of emergencies that will allow the countries to report a, a, earlier, to have rapid responses. So instead of shutting down all the borders, helping each other. So I think this, this idea of, of global health, having models that not only come from the north, that we have models from everywhere, and the example is Africa, is one of the things. The second that has to do a little bit with your coin idea is that working in global health shouldn't be seen as a kind of, as, as an act of kindness, okay? It's something that we need to do because it's a matter of cell security. So use it in a very selfish way, but it is. And my last comment is that I see the world, unless the world starts considering, I mean, as an example, regionalism, real regionalism, we're not going to have good responses. I think the worst that happened for Latin America is that pa the Pan American Health Organization, for example, is located in Washington, D.C., and that whenever we, we use the numbers for, for America, they said the Americas, right? But that's the United States and Canada, and, and they mix it with all Latin America, they're all in one sack. So we need to see global health, again, as this process of collective action, but, and, and it's not the South, the North, that can teach everything to the South. We have models everywhere, and probably regions, instead of talking every, like everybody is the same in, in low middle income countries, we have regions, and we could start thinking about a regional responses that could, could be the way to go. 
And I hope that every single person that wants to work and it's training global health also learn about politics. Because although we don't want them, okay, we have to live with them if we work in global health and in public health. Totally, totally. You've all given us so much, so much to think about. I see that there are two people uh, are ready who are lined up and if we can take both of these questions and then others if you want to come and line up this would be the moment may I start with you at, at the back yes good evening I thank uh, all of the guest speakers uh, my name is Lena Elsraf. I'm a family physician. I work at a community health clinic here in Los Angeles. I have just a couple points, and I'd love to hear your comments on them. Uh, for one, I, I would love to, it, everything seems so compartmentalized, even coming to this, uh, you know, conference. It would, not, it would be nice as we had the state of the union to have the state of the world, to see where we're at and just get a glimpse of what's going on in the different uh, countries and, and, and continents. Secondly, in terms of like uh, getting information, like the media we need to hold accountable. We don't hear about any other countries other than what we, what's going on here and even that is limited. Uh, thirdly, I, I want to say that here at this conference, there is a, an elephant in the room. I, there's no session on what's going on in Gaza. There's nobody mentioning it on the stage. And this is one of the worst crises here in our history, in our lifetime. And we have not said anything about it. And, and so, you know, as, even as little as serving Starbucks, which is on the BDS list, the boycott, divestment, sanction, we can at least stop drinking that. Uh, so I would love to hear how we as a global community can really be relevant and to really be a force and come together and be the solution that you speak about. Thank you. Thank you. L let me take this question as well. I'll take two at a time, if I may take this question. Uh, my name is uh, Quentin Eichbaum. I'm at Vanderbilt University and direct a couple of programs there. So if you're talking about the future of global health, it's very important, and you had one small question there, to look at what is happening to trainees going into global health. That's critical. So I'm interested in having the panel reflect on the impact, because two things converged at the same time, and I was part of both of them, the decolonization movement and the pandemic. And we did a survey of 254 global health programs around the world to look at the impact of COVID-19 on education, research, and administration of global health programs. Of those 350, only 17 were from low and middle income countries. That was very telling, we couldn't get any more. And the point there is that global health is a Western construct to begin with. There aren't many global health programs outside of the, the global north. And that's part of the crisis for us in global health. It's a construct that we've made. We do global health. The global south lives global health, so to speak. But my question is, because I, I think there has been an impact, and some of the comments we got through the survey showed that they had. What has been the impact on the global north, trainees, and students going into global health? Prior to the pandemic and the decolonization movement, there was a white savioristic kind of fervor and 30,000 Americans descending on African countries every year to do their global health and save the world. I saw, and I'm curious, do you think there has been a very healthy self-reflection on the part of trainees that that's not what we should be doing anymore and that they are holding back a little bit more, going into this with a little bit more circumspection given decolonization and uh, COVID-19, or has there been no impact? Two very deep questions. Can we go down any responses to the two questions that we've just heard? We, we, we just, in fact, completed a, a seminar, a two-week seminar on global health for medical uh, students in second year. and. Uh, it is true their perception of global health was that it would be they getting on a plane and going out to work in uh, low or medium income countries. We rectified that and several times we emphasized the fact that every day in a medical setting or a health setting or in the educational setting, wherever you are, you are 
contributing or not to global health. And I think that shifted their mind a little bit and um, they indeed uh, became interested in knowing how best they could work in, within a global health that would provide them reference values and um, a system, uh, norms and perhaps standards within global health that they could apply to their own education and daily work. Other reflections, please, Faye. Yeah, uh, I mean, I completely agree that uh, the concept of global health is a construct of the North, okay? And um, we're working, we're trying to create a consortium of universities in Latin America, really. But one of the things is that um, part of it, it's a survey trying to understand if there are programs of global health, what do they consider this, et cetera. It's ongoing, okay? But one of the realities is that global health, from the point of view, and, and because there are different ways of, of seeing global health also, I mean, I think it's a way of, of, it's a process of collaborative working, right? Because I have had that experience too. Um, but from the point of view of the training, unfortunately, and, and I don't think, I'm not the one to start that discussion. I think it has to come from the, the universities in the north, really, but I have said it several times. I work in Peru. I live and I, I, I work and I train in Peru because I wanted to bring whatever I learn in, in the States because I stayed here like 10 years training my masters, my residencies, et cetera. I wanted to bring everything that I learned into my country with a different mentality, right? Not the mentality of the immigrant that stayed, but the mentality of somebody who brings whatever richness into their own country. So I, I, I really um, think that this whole thing about the conceptualization of global health from the point of view of training is seen in countries like mine as an opportunity for students to do a little bit of tourism, okay? For people to feel good about themselves, about the kind, kindness, okay? And, um, and in, in a wrong way, creating citizens that are thinking that that's a way of growing global health. I mean, it, in my experience, that has not happened with the trainees that I have had. And I have several trainees that are doing great things. I mean, they have trained with me from the US and now are my colleagues and we are creating networks for me this interaction or this transfer or these opportunities of students from the US to come to our countries should be the way of creating better networks around, but not always that happens. So I think this is something that needs to be discussed on the other side. We are gonna discuss, discuss it on this side, um, but, but definitely happens and definitely especially in, in institutions in Latin America, global health is not a term that has really been taken. And that's probably why there are very few of us mm -hmm. here. I hear you. I, okay. Sure. Um, I like to look at uh, global health as something that is multi-sectoral and it it uh, intersects with many existing training, you know, programs and things like that. But I also like to point to the values of international elective programs or the values of um, international experiential learning. And it should not be tagged that, okay, the global north comes to the global south, or the global south goes to the global north, or there is global south to south, or global north to north, no. I think at the end of that day, wherever you're going, you, you learn something. And I believe there are very many people from the global north that have learned from Africa, you know? and. Uh, 
thanks to Professor Joe Colas. He's always very good at admitting that he learned a lot from Africa. And many people who have come to Africa have learned something. So how do we advance this in a way that we all feel we are striking an equilibrium? Let's have equitable collaborations. When we sit to make these MOUs with the Global North, Global South, Global South, Global, you know, whatever it is, let's come with an equitable lens, you know? Let's be fair as we negotiate. Okay, Jocelyn, do you have something to add? Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, first I want to acknowledge the comment about the elephant in the room, which is, of course, a sick indictment on a gathering of people interested in global health that we should allow such atrocities and the starving of children to be something that goes unacknowledged. So I, you know, I just wish to acknowledge the importance of that. Um, but I also, um, want to also reflect on the question that was asked by the gentleman in the room. Because in addition to some of the models that both Faith and Patty have raised, is a really interesting um, proposal that Madhu Pai and Sonia Anant made recently in Lancet Global Health. Um, my friend and colleague Zoe Mullen is in the room, which is who I'm pointing to in her journal. And what they've described is a way of potentially harnessing the passions and interests of the, I mean, apparently, like 75% of medical schools in North America have a global health program, such as the you know, level of interest of trainees um, in this part of the world to do global health work. But what they're suggesting is that that may not be fit for purpose, for some of the reasons you guys have mentioned. And what they're suggesting is that those interests and passions and skills be harnessed to look and work at inequities that are existing within America, Canada. I mean, totally. in downtown LA, it's very apparent in, you know, racialized communities, indigenous communities, um, et cetera, that this might be mm -hmm. perhaps even a better way of, of, of training up interested students in global health. And they, of course, use the, the old term of global, that all of our concerns in global health, including those we're talking about today, have relevance for our local communities where disparity and inequity exist in spades. And that was published like a few months ago, I think, sort of September, October, and, and worth looking at. Thank you, and there are good examples of that happening around, if I can. May I take the, the, question, the two questions here, these two microphones, and then we'll, we'll come back around again, and then I'll come over to this side. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I want to pose a question to the panel. Um, today, very good words have been used, you know, equity, uh, advocacy, power dynamics. <laughs> And when you look at the Lancet editorial of March 2nd, there was a piece of writing that was talking about the pandemic treaty and how shameful and unjust it's been compared to what it started when the main goal was to protect everyone everywhere, uh, irrespective of the economic power. And COVID taught us that uh, public health emergencies of global health importance can occur anywhere, everywhere, at any time. But then when you talk about power, for example, you realize that in the treaty, uh, the common language that has shaped up over time is that for almost every idea within the, the, within the treaty, they are saying that where appropriate, the funding will be provided. And the problem is, the person who decides the appropriateness is the person with money and the power. We've talked about advocacy today. We've talked about equity. What do we imagine as the willingness of the person who's going to decide the where appropriate is willing to listen to the voices of advocacy from those who do not have the doors, and so those who are the weakest, 
how much do you think that voice is going to be impactful to the person with the doras and thus the power? Thank you. Thank you. May I take this question as well? Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Sahar Mahoudian. I'm an undergraduate student from the University of Toronto. Um, I wanted your perspectives on something I've noticed, which is a big, my apologies if this is a bit long-winded. <laughs> um, I notice a big dif dissonance between my academic and non-academic circles that are working towards global health and human rights advocacy in the sense that they're both working towards um, dismantling oppressive systems and eradicating systemic barriers, um, using anti-oppressive decolonial, de decolonial pedagogy, all of that. Um, but in the non-academic side, I find that there is almost exclusively a push to work towards that in a way that is anti-establishment, in a way that is radical and revolutionary and like potentially uncomfortable for the people who perpetuate these systems of oppression. On the other end of it, I find that in academic settings, it's not possible to do that. It's almost entirely bureaucratic, entirely um, often at and funded by like inherently colonial institutions. As previously mentioned with what's happening in Palestine, I think about how people take to the streets every single week and these, meanwhile, in Congress and in large global health bodies, there are long bureaucratic processes that, while important, every single day that they take longer to come to decisions are more days where lives are being lost. And so I wonder if you think that academic global health um, has anything to learn from more grassroots perspectives? Um, if grassroots, pers like, if gra grassroots initiatives have anything to learn from more academic um, global health perspectives, and if they're mutually exclusive, or if the future of global health moves towards them coexisting in some sort of way. Thank you. Thank you for that. If we can have a quick round of responses, because I still see that we have people here that would like to ask some questions. Who would like to begin? Faith, I, I, did, did you, are you good? Yeah. All right. Um, to the point of the gentleman who said, how do we, you know, the dollar thing and all that. I'd like to give an example of what we do at Intel's. And our model is not to go and impose ourselves. We are not a funding organization, please not. But we always offer some seed funding to things and we ensure before we start, we have a sustainability plan. So we do not go out there and say, do this. We go down to the grassroots in Africa, and that's my job because I lead the implementation of our Africa programs. And we listen to what each stakeholder needs in that domain. And we fund in terms of speaking from the grassroots to, you know, funding what is priority. And many times we found that successful because it's also part of the local priorities agenda. It's feeding into their strategic plan. And um, they have to report on what they've done in that. So working with them to support them through what they think is relevant has been our approach and been very successful for the last 10 years. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And any other reflections on this See, panel? Yeah, yeah, maybe a short answer. I mean, your point about academicians and, and civil society, let's say, right? I think we need to understand that we need to work together, definitely. So if, if we talk about the, the way forward, we need to work together. I think we can learn from each other, but probably each of us does one thing better. So civil society needs data that can be produced by us. Sometimes we need somebody to scream, and they can scream for us, okay? Because the bureaucratic system and the institution doesn't allow you to scream, so they can scream for us. So I think that that way of seeing global health, so working together, I mean, I found during, during the pandemic that the journalists, at least in Peru, did a fantastic job, okay? Once they had the data or the information that was right, it was, better even than the government. So, but several times what happened is that as academicians, we stay in the 
you call it ivory tower, right? That's interesting, yeah. In the <laughs> ivory tower, yeah? What's it called? In the castle. <laughs> so, same, same yeah, it, it means the same, right? And we don't want to talk with anybody or be in touch. I think it's time for us to come down and make friends of everybody and work together. I think that's a way forward in global health. Thank you. I, I'm really conscious of time and people, if I can ask each of you to make a brief, like your, your brief comment question as quickly as you can so we can have one right, last round from everybody to respond. I would be great if we can start with you. Hi, uh, I'm Shashika Bandar from McGill University. Uh, just to give context, I'm from Sri Lanka. I grew up from there. So um, I recognize the power hierarchies that we talked about. I also recognize the line of thought of uh, collective action. Uh, but I want to ask, uh, you know, there, there needs to be a confrontation of the status quo in order to change what is happening. So how do you reflect on that and, and you know, how do you envision making change because we just cannot collaborate. I have another sub question on it is that race as a determinant of health because discrimination is a determinant of health and we have talked a lot about power hierarchies. So I also want to, uh, if you can add to your reflection on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Oh. Hi, my name is Bernice. I'm an OBGYN that currently works in Pennsylvania, but before that I was born and raised and studied in Peru. So I have worked in Peru as well and know, and know what inequities I had patients died on me for because of them. Um, but unfortunately, as many international medical graduates, I did not secure a position uh, for residence in an academic position, and now due to the US, we're not in an academic position yet. So what do, what do you recommend for somebody that he works in a community hospital, like many, many immigrant doctors, um, to approach global health, how, how to start? Should we go through our usual academic route, you know, MPH, or, um, or what are your recommendations? And then I also think we should have more outreach to the community um, hospitals, because there's a lot of people that could participate. Thank you very much. Last 30 seconds, please. Thank you. François Dabis, University of Bordeaux in France, and the Daniel. Uh, terrific, uh, terrific panel and terrific session. I'm just wondering whether the panelists lacked a historical perspective on, on, on the issue of global health. In other words, globalization started more than 40 years ago, and to a certain extent, global health was the, health was the last uh, topic or the last area in which you know, globalization arrived. And we, of course, thought at that time that like for all aspects of globalization, we will succeed in, in many ways. And we are probably at the end of this cycle, uh, and this cycle has created a lot of wealth, but uh, also a lot of inequalities. Uh, and therefore, what we have in, in global health remains probably the best example of what should be uh, the, in the future of globalization. So I would argue that we should stick to equity, accountability and social protection, as you said, and that translates into intermediate outcomes uh, such as universal uh, health coverage. I wouldn't change anything to defining uh, global health and what it should, not, should be. Thank you. So we again have a final round of reflections from this group from everything that you've heard. Patty, can I start with you? Oh, start there. Oh, start there. I see. Okay. We're starting at the other end. Danielle, we're starting with you. Thank you. He's got the microphone. Sorry. Um, should I or should please, you? Should please. I? Okay, very, very briefly. Um, this is a, a good point that the uh, global economic, uh, the, the economic globalization actually made things worse when it comes from a health perspective, more inequalities, um, uh, deepening uh, in, uh, inequities within and uh, across countries and so forth. So the point is well taken that I think um, public health, global health should be very high on the globalization agenda if any is coming forward. Um, to one person who asked about taking stock of uh, the health of the people, I just want to mention without being uh, subsidized for publicity, that the American Journal of Public Health uh, published a report or did a, a webcast on the state of the nation's health, covering America, but also its relations to uh, other countries. So that's one step towards um, becoming, in the, in the medical journals, accountable uh, on progress and lack thereof in many fields of health. 
We have not addressed several questions that were asked concerning the treaty, but I don't feel qualified to do that, frankly. I think we need a sharp lawyer to do it, and Thank I'm not you. one of Thank them. Thank you, Faith. Any last comment? Sure. Um, for me, I think it's important that today we've had this conversation, and everyone today is very important in the sense that they, they should be actually here at the panel and also share their experiences. I think we all need each other, the global north, global south, global south to south, whatever it is that we call it. We all need each other, but let's work in an equitable lens. Thank you. Jocelyn. Thank you. 100% agree, Shashika, that the status quo is an inequitable one. And um, I think we've all made that clear that that's what we're driving toward in terms of redressing. So what does change look like from the point of view of journals? These are very low hanging fruit, but they're important and not all journals do them. So you must demand them of your local journal. But the big journals, what are we doing? Number one, requiring local expertise and lived experience experience. That is part of the criteria. If it's not there in the author byline, then the paper is not worth pursuing or acceptable. Secondly, there are now new guidelines and principles around international collaborative authorship. They're out there, they're published, they can guide you in um, cultivating equitable relationships as groups of authors when you submit papers. More and more journals like my own and others are requiring that. Evidence from you that equitable research collaborations are in place. Again, there's guidance out there. Many journals are now requiring it and endorsing it. So we're leveraging our role as gatekeepers to say, if you want to publish global health, and we really want to publish the best global health research and commentary, this has to be genuinely equitable if it involves an international collaboration. A really good tool that, that folks have um, promoted and I think more and more journals are adopting is the use of reflexivity statements. It's another way for authors when they submit their papers to us to demonstrate that they have reflected on their own privilege, on their own um, relationships, and that equal credit and responsibility are being assumed. Some journals require diversity and inclusion tables, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and finally, the use of affirmative action, or you would call it in America affirmative action. In Britain, we call it positive action. Journals have a lot of power to leverage when they go out to commission content. We're no longer, um, as I said earlier, accepting that Colleagues from the Global North can speak on behalf of those in the Global South. So we can use our um, scope of practice to surface new and diverse talent. It's in abundance Thank you. in the entire world. And we can ensure that we platform um, those perspectives um, to create more diversity and equity. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Last word, Patty, please. Oh, yeah, uh, for my colleague from Peru, OK? So I would recommend you to, to do the, the master, get some skills, get some tools. But the other thing is remember, if you're gonna be working on, on, on these issues of global health, you need collaborators, you need networks. Remember, it's a collective action, so um, don't be alone. And, and that's true for everybody, right? So, so can, I, can you join me in thanking this wonderful panel for their work? Honestly, really, really grateful for, for the reflections and the depth of this. Now, now, we go out to the reception out there where we can continue this conversation all together. Thank you very much to your audience for having hung out with us this long. <laughs>